there is a, uh, a bit of a break after this for about uh, 20 minutes before the keynote begins uh, in room 219. Our session at the moment is called the assessment panel. We've got Chris, Paul, and Morgan. You know them, you love them. And they said they've got to introduce themselves. So, Hi, uh, my name is Morgan Jaffet. I uh, co founded and, and run a small independent developer of about a dozen people in Brisbane called Fine Development. In the last 18 months since our inception, we've worked on a, uh, on a number of projects um, from Warco, which is going to be war journalism, Rocket Bunnies, which is a quite successful mobile title, and uh, we're currently at work on a fantasy action RPG for tablets as well as technical level and working on a bunch of other stuff. Um, I wish to do introductions first and then we'll talk about the whole yeah, assessment cool. angle. Yeah, cool. Hi, my name is Paul Gellman. Uh, I'm a freelance writer uh, and developer and teacher and curator. Um, I'm the director of the Triple A Independent Games Festival. Um, I haven't shipped a game in about a very long time, but I have worked on a lot of stuff that's been cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We can go toe to toe on cancel titles. Um, I am really interested in kind of the cultural side of things and, and um, the cult level of cultural engagement, as you may have guessed from everything I've said previously and the question I just asked in the session. Um, I've also done a whole bunch of assessments, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, my name is Chris Wright. I run a marketing agency for Game Games, which was launched. Uh, six weeks ago. Uh, and prior to that, I was a THD for seven years, um, initially working in the product management team, eventually heading up marketing for Asia Pacific. And then at the start of this year, I joined the Two Australian Studios as their marketing director, um, which is essentially a global marketing role, liaising between the global brand team and the studio, setting direction and positioning for their products. Um, which turned out to be really good timing because six months later, we um, had the studio shut down um, on us, along with the other 200 devs out of work and um, basically decided to do the same as most developers that get made redundant and go indie um, and basically I guess the mission that I'm on is to kind of reinvent publishing as a service for developers so the developers are in charge of that service as opposed to the publishing being in charge so that's essentially I guess where I'm coming from and um, in the last two years the kind of what got me to that point of thinking that's what was needed is that I sat on the film, I sit on the film big panel and see those assessments and I suppose the, uh, I'll talk about it later, but the most remarkable thing about those was I was the guy there to judge the marketing and there would be no marketing to judge, um, which really showed me like, where I guess the, uh, the gap was in the independent scene and perhaps where I'm at. So just as a sort of a preamble then, the, the idea for this session came about from um, seeing a lot of sessions where you would kind of get the, the government representatives who administer the fund, um, people like Mike and, and Brad from 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 right? um, and they would sort of tell you what they were looking for and what the kind of the, the requirements for it were and what the the, um, the actual submission documents were. Um, but I thought it would be really interesting rather than to get their perspective to actually get the assessors together. The giant robot in there is going to kill you all. Um, there's no but at the end of the talk. Yeah, so the end of the talk. Don't, don't leave now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I thought it would be really interesting to get the assessors together. So the role of an assessor, and you guys can jump in at any point, basically when something gets submitted to the funding agencies, they have a requirement that it gets assessed by experts hello, um, in the field. And so they get sent to us and we basically write a report. Um, and some of the agencies have different reporting requirements that are very stringent and some are much looser. And we write that, that goes back to the funding agency. They take that in, into account when they're, they're sort of determining what to fund, then that gets submitted to the funding agency's board, and then they do the final sort of stand. So we see, I mean, it sort of depends on the body, but we see a range of submissions for a range of different programs, um, and then we make recommendations on that. I guess we should caveat all of this by saying we probably can't talk about specific projects, but we will be able to talk in general terms about what works and what doesn't work, and, and what we're looking for and what sort of recommendations we do. So to, to start, we'll maybe talk about what we have, like who we've assessed for. So I've assessed um, for the screen, the New South Wales Department of Business and Innovation, I think 
goes uh, round, which is the three million every year for three years. I think it's a lot of money. Um, I've assessed for Screen Australia as well. Um, I have assessed for Film Victoria. I've also been on applications that have been successful and been rejected by two of those organisations. I uh, am in a very similar situation, except uh, the only assessing I've done is for Screen Australia, and uh, I uh, defined as received uh, funding from Screen Australia. We've been involved in executing on the projects that have received in which other parties have received funding and uh, I've been on a broad number of funding applications both successful and not successful. My role with Film Victoria is probably slightly different in that Film Victoria has both assessors, uh, which Paul and, and Morgan would do, and then also a panel which uh, assesses everything. So essentially, Film Victoria, there's like a handful of people that assess your application in depth and prepare a report. Um, your application plus that report goes to a panel, um, we then read all of those, and it's usually 15 or 20 uh, per round. And then um, we sit around the room and debate whether or not the assessor's recommendation should be uh, gone ahead with, or whether we disagree. <coughs> sometimes we give more money, sometimes we give less, uh, put conditions on it, or so on. So it's, I guess it's not as quite in depth because you've got 20 to read. But in Bill Victoria, that panel's really important because they make the, the final recommendation to the board that then makes the final decision. So. Um, it's as important to think about them as I guess it is the person that's doing the in-depth assessment because they both have a, a key role in deciding what goes ahead. So we might just talk for a little bit about what we're looking for. And I guess this is a sort of session that probably benefits a lot from questions and having to answer questions. Um, that's probably the most value for people. So I guess, I mean, I guess the place to start is what is it that we sort of look for? Individually, and I'm talking to these guys um, separately. It, it's different but similar. So, I mean, basically, whenever I get a funding application, I ask myself two questions. I ask myself, if this was my money, would I give it to these people? Uh, which is a really useful sort of yardstick along the way. And also, like, is there a vision here? Like, that's sort of the most important thing for me. There's nothing. If I don't get excited about a project, if I can't see like the actual creative vision, and if I can't see the person or the, the creative direction of the team behind that project, it's just separate from whether or not the submission itself is not that great. Um, those are the two things that I sort of that I sort of go for. So whether or not I give people money, and that's a really good question to think about when you're writing romance, would you pay for this? Um, and also like is the vision in it interesting and creative and Ambitious, I guess, is the word I'm sort of looking for. Uh, you know, if you're just sort of submitting a game and a genre that's been done a million times before, it's a much harder sell than something I feel has a need to exist as a game. Um, and I guess that comes out of my cultural sort of interest. Like, I'm not interested in sort of product. You know, I'm interested in things that actually matter and mean something and move the medium forward. So that's sort of th those are the things that I sort of look at when I'm going through assessments. Yeah, so I find it from a slightly different perspective in that I'm very interested in looking at what the game is and whether it looks good. And I've sat through uh, a lot of pictures and I've pitched for a lot of work, um, both at uh, Behaviour Interactive in Montreal and my time at Relic and uh, in Pandemic I was responsible for pitching and, and gaining funding for projects to, to quite large sums of money and uh, I was responsible for being on the other side. So I, I definitely come at it from a commercial background because that's my background. So I want to see a, a game proposal and a game pitch that makes sense. But realistically, with where the Australian industry is at, uh, the thing I tend to look for most is that this isn't just a thing. You know, that this is a case of, okay, so the money comes in here and it enables us to do this because we're a team of people and we're, we, we're able to do something and through money, we can unlock the potential that we wouldn't have if we didn't have funding. So I want to see a concrete result from that cash into a something. And that something's a, a pretty broad uh, spectrum. But I, I, in, in my kind of personal uh, preferences, you know, I like to see people say, yes, we're going to grow the, the industry in Australia. We're going to grow what we're doing. This, this enables us to attain scope and scale and science and future. So I, I'm less interested in here's our single game as cultural artifact, and much more about, yeah, here's how this sets us up for success. Even if this one doesn't necessarily make the money back, it's a 
building of reputation and skill sets that leads to future titles and future success. Um, and I'm going to go somewhat the opposite way to Paul on the genre of the question, which is Paul wants to see new things, things that have never been done before. And uh, I'm okay with seeing that if you've got a really good history of doing stuff that's been done before. But I never want to see people's first project as nothing like anything that's ever existed, because I don't believe you. And you can prove me wrong, and that's that's awesome. You know, if you, you do that, it's totally. Cool. But you won't pay for it. Uh, well, I probably wouldn't have funded Alexander Bruce to give an example of where right. that doesn't work particularly well, and clearly that's awesome, and you've made that, that pay off. Um, but no one's ever funded him. Like he's just a monster. Yeah, that's what I thought. So he's he's totally in the proves me wrong. He's just awesome, <laughs> and that's that's fine. Um, Alexander Bruce has a game called Antichamber. It's called Antichamber. Anti it's kind of been called like three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's called Antichamber, which is a fantastic non-Euclidean space uh, was, game. Built it was yeah, as a yeah, as of the journey of life. Yeah, um, and yeah, those are the sorts of really speculative things. I actually think that could have been rounded into a pitch that would have been funded, but it's a much trickier proposition. I, I want to see how you step from something that exists to something just beyond that, not how you come out of the creepy left centre. And uh, if you can explain this really, really superbly articulately, you're, you're self manipulative. Superb and articulate and passionate and fantastic, then that overrides a whole bunch of other stuff. It's a safer bet to go with someone I understand and take me to how you take those in class. Yeah. It's kind of similar. I suppose Film Victoria has um, has a very specific criteria that Film Victoria's money is a loan, not a grant. And Film Victoria is expecting that money to get paid back, which means they act more like an invest, like the nicest investor you'll ever have, <laughs> essentially, because you only pay it back out of profit, and it's at a very low percentage rate, and they don't take equity and all those kind of things. But it is an investment. So I always act it as if, I'm a publisher, this, again, this is my money, and if I was a, a, a publisher putting this button out there, do I think this will make money back? And then the next thing is, is this actually an interesting game you know, that, that I would play or that I can see someone playing? You know, is it, is it, you know, I'm kind of in the middle, right? But, you know, I don't necessarily want something that's completely new and novel, particularly because that's a dangerous commercial risk, depending on how much money they're asking for. Um, but he put it out on coffee cat game where it's like, okay, they've gone out, they've taken that game back to the new art skin and, and, and they're calling it unique, which is the most overused word in applications and one piece of advice I would have you is don't put unique in, unless it genuinely really is unique, because assessors read it all the time. Um, but yeah, and, and I suppose one of the interesting things I find in jumping around a bit is, is you tend to get an instant impression from the application of these things. It's not something that takes you all 40 pages to read. Um, and you, you almost make up your mind quite quickly, or at least get a, kind of get a position from that first impression. Um, so I, I particularly like to see an application that is immediately well presented, that I don't have to fight through to get to that that thing that I want to see. So someone, had, someone, do you guys want to take questions as we go, or do you want to take questions? Oh, no, why not? So sure. Let, let's let's break it up. Somebody go there and then back. Everyone's yeah. Cool. Hi. Me? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what about reputation of that? Studio, but someone who may have a couple of smaller titles under their belt, if they're good at something that at a particular thing, does that sort of come into <coughs> the assessment, or is it purely just a one-off? We're just looking at this application and, and whether that content is something that you would fund, or yeah, does does reputation <coughs> guess, like for stuff me, coming into it always come to you? Mm -hmm. um, particularly as you say, if you've got a reputation if you've done things in the past, and you can show how that. Uh, builds organically to the next thing, that's, that's great. On the other hand, if you're saying, you know, well, we don't want to be stereotyped, we've done this in the past, now we want to use that to go here, then I'm a fan of that too, given the right setup. I still think it's important to let a bridge experience and skills. Um, you know, watching, uh, I've watched successful companies at quite large scales from you know, rational camera to developing that to the to the time that we saw build from one game to the next, which may not necessarily share the theme and genre, but share enough important elements to enable you to take the skills from one game. I wouldn't spend five years making RTSs, you really don't have RTSs. And I, I, I take that very seriously. I'm very interested in the skill sets that people involved. Yeah, so am I. It comes out of the question of 
can you do this? Can you, can you do what you are telling me you can do? And part of that is reputation. Um, part of that is kind of your gut feeling about how well they presented it and also how well they've articulated it. But yeah, I, I, I definitely do. And I think on some applications, I've actually gone out and done extra research that of stuff that wasn't presented. So I could get a sense of what individuals on the team had done before and what their actual input was to, to get a better sense of that. Um, because again, it comes down to like, I treat it like it's my money. Like I'm asking the question, would, would I make this investment myself? And if someone tells me they can do it, can prove to me that they can you know, make this game, to you know, within a certain margin of error, yeah, then I'll, like that's, it's totally, largely creative industries are entirely about reputation, you know, um, both for good and for bad. Um, so, so yeah, totally comes down to, I mean, yeah, it, it, big deal, I think. Yeah. Absolutely, I think the, um, the journey that you want the assessor to go on is, oh, this looks like an interesting idea, you know, so now they're interested in what they're going to read. Particularly, guys like me that have 20 to read in the space of about 10 days, they get really hard to read after a while, right? So the interesting idea from the start, then it's like, okay, I can picture this, which is a hard thing to do on paper, to show how the game works. You can describe it in a way like I can understand the game. Now I'm good. Then the last piece of the puzzle is, can I, do I believe these guys can actually deliver the idea that they've got me interested in? And, and that's almost the order you want to communicate this stuff to the bottom. So reputation and skill set, all that come, almost comes in at the, the end for me. It's the last piece of the, the pie. So it's not an automatic thing, whereas like, okay, these guys have made a bunch of stuff before tick the box. You've still got to have an interesting idea. You've still got to communicate it well. Um, but if you get through those first two things, and then I'm like, okay, these guys have never made a game before. The rest of the application's not really there. They don't think they've done the design work, the budget's all kind of out. Then you might fall over at that point. Numbers are really important. Yeah. Like num and they're really important from that gut check perspective, because I know broadly speaking what things should cost, what things should sell, and what sort of cut you know a third party might take out of it if your relationships with X, Y, and Z. And if those sorts of things are out by a substantial magnitude, then I begin to question the, the rest of the logic that has been put together. Yeah, so that's the proposition. So. Yeah, like I've got through, like one of the things that I've done is, is budget assessment. So you're actually kind of put through a budget line by line and go, does this seem reasonable? You know, and you certainly do get a sense of, are they just going on cheap here? Like, is, is, is this reasonable? Um, the other thing, like I wanted to touch by what Chris said as well, is that what I find myself doing is going through it twice. You know, that you sort of read through it to get the sense and then you go back through it with the, the reputation idea. Like, who are these guys now that I know what the game is and do I think they can achieve it? So yeah, you sort of have these sort of processes that you're you're looking to get excited, and then you're kind of going through the two to go, right? How does this actually sort of fit together? And do these guys know? And is it articulated their, their knowledge within it? I think we've got another question here, and then back. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was asking. So you guys got a, an application that had a really fresh team that had pretty much no commercial history behind them. Um, are you saying like it's very hard for you guys to sign off on it? Like, it just what, what needs to make sense. So if, if you tell me that four people who are veteran, and I'll use RTS as an example, four veteran RTS developers want to put together an ambitious RTS project for mobile devices that draws on, you know, that will, that's Warcraft 3 for, for touch, then the first thing I go is, well, Warcraft 3 is an 80 person team, but okay, if you if you convince me that you you've got the scale to work on mobile, I know you've got the experience, so that's good. If that's four completely fresh people with no game background saying, yep, we want to make uh, Warcraft for the for tablet, and there's no long explanation of how that's going to work and make sense, then that's much harder. On the other hand, if they present a bunch of screens and it, it's something that ends up looking like, let's say, Battleheart, which is a good iOS game. That, that uses similar mechanics, but in a way that's, that's massively simplified and can be realistically made by four people, then that's a great proposition. And I look at that and go, yep, yeah, that's the right first project for these people. Uh, when I speak to film people, which I do a lot about projects, almost always they come and say, look, the game you want to make is like World of Warcraft, except it's also got a bit of Sims thrown in, and it kind of plays like Halo. And, uh, and it's got, yeah, it's got all the sharing stuff from from Spore and uh, 
and yet we want to make that. A lot of people are remote like students. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you say, well, that's fine. Do you have eight hundred million dollars? Because that's what that would cost. And they say we were thinking five thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I think the key is achievability. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, and how much money are you asking for? If you're asking for a hundred thousand, which is the maximum from Pivot Victoria, you better be a, an experienced team that knows what you're doing. That we're going to trust you with a hundred thousand. If you're asking for 10,000 because you need to bring on an artist to help you out or something like that, you know, it's far more likely that you'll get that as a fresh team because the, you know, the scale of investment is also the scale of confidence that you need. Mm -hmm. I, did, sorry. I was going to say achievability is sort of married with appropriateness. You yeah. know, you sort of like, have you thought about like the reasonable, you know, the state of your project, the state of the team in a meaningful way and gone, it is appropriate that we ask for X amount of dollars. No, because sometimes the assessments where like they, they, they've thought about when a project is this size, and the amount of money they're asking for is like ten of those. <coughs> this is a massive amount. And you're sitting there going, yeah, if we give you all that money, you could do that project and ten projects of that size. Yeah. Um, so it's also it's also that it's also the thinking about what the like actually scoping it realistically. I, I'm becoming on the the team thing. I'm totally with Morgan as well. It just convinces that it can be done and and, and make sure that it is achievable and appropriate and and of the server right scale, like what we're trying to do. Another great thing for fresh teams is experience menopause. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the, the flip side inside. But I help with in an advisory capacity with other teams, and that's useful for them because they can sit down and talk about how everything's going and stuff together. But if you can show that there's a wealth of experience, you know, if you can have a conversation with people who do have that experience, sell them one one on one and get them to get involved, that helps too. Yeah, that's because we've heard everyone the same thing from investors, not so much about yeah. brands, but well, same problem, freshly in the industry, mm -hmm. they don't get around advisory board. So you guys do actually take that into consideration. Yeah. Like someone was. I probably push harder on that front because I spend a bunch of time up on the other side of capital raising and traditional investment angles as well. So. Yeah, one of the interesting things, one of my the interesting experiences that I had working with the New South Wales um, funding agency was that they, spoke to me about the mentor thing. So they were actually kind of working to set studios up like with mentors. So I think that it's it's actually something that I don't I don't think Phil Vick have done that. So I think it's something that is is definitely really valuable. So either if you can find one yourself or if you can go and talk to to the people who administer the funds and go, hey we you know we think we have this gap, can you help us fill it before and, they yeah, really use that to set step sideways and yeah. saying really, which is a, my, my current feeling, having spoken to a bunch of people, and as I say, we've, we've received funding. Um, I spend a bunch of time with filmmakers who are really across the previous session dealt with things like how producer offset works and how that could apply to games. And I spend a lot of time with film producers who are immense and immersed in a culture of putting together a funding package. So all of these things that, that we've spoken about from Antoine and how they might draw an offset here, which lets them get some funding from here, which lets them bring really in some third party funding that they'd be reimbursed. And there's a gap, I feel, at the moment uh, in the broader game development community. Certainly, I've learned all of this the hard way in terms of what funding might be available, how you might put it together. And the screen agencies are great in terms of pick up, pick up phone and call and say, look at my advance. Excuse me, that how it's work. You know, this is what we want to do. <coughs> How could we get there? I do feel like a lot of people never talk to anybody, go to the website, look at the application form, fill it in, and that's the first time of communication they have to, with the agency. And if you do that, then you lose all the advantages that you possibly could have had of saying, hey, this is what I want to do. Does it make sense? And they'll, they'll tell you straight up, you know, well, look, we're going to be looking at this, this, and this, and you said this, and I'm worried about that, and, you know, if you, if you could bring some, if you bring this expertise on board, I could do that and introduce you. Um, I've found the agencies to be completely accommodating on that front, but the knowledge is, isn't enmeshed in the game development culture. You know, on the film side, people go through something like art films where they'll spend three years learning to be a producer. You know, learning how these offsets work, learning how to finance stuff, learning how to run the budgets. Um, most game people think they want to make awesome games. And most people film get the company because they'll make awesome films, but along the way they can involve this business side of things. So that's to me that's the biggest gap we have at the moment, and that's the biggest hole we need to find 
these bootstrapping people can understand in their, how to get to their objective with the help of everything that's around. Uh, do we have uh, the bike in the middle of the question? Hi. Uh, can we make all the bike in the back I'm quite interested in knowing how you separate, um, I suppose, the execution of the concept as liberty versus the concept. You know, because they're quite different things, and of course, the funding could change that drastically. I, I, hmm, this may not completely. Are you, are you asking how we read an assessment and work out whether or not it can become a game? When, when you put an assessment in, it, yep. it's obviously at a point of time of time or yep. conceptualization. Um, now, beyond that, you're probably progressing. You know, when I put my film Victoria uh, application in, my concept is quite different now to, what, six weeks ago yep. when I put it in there. Um, but the concept is the same. It's the execution still. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and you'll, you'll never know that because you know the money's going to actually act. It's showing its cap, it's going to have an impact on what's going to happen. I, um, I think that you can tell. I might be wrong and incredibly arrogant. I, th I think that what you're looking for in the session is the, the core of it, like the heart mm -hmm. of your game. Like, you're absolutely right that the execution can and the execution should in a lot of cases change as you're developing a game and as you're iterating and as it's evolving. But I think that in a good in a good sort of a how do I say this? I I think there are bad ideas and I think you can tell when an idea is bad. And I think you can tell when an idea is good. And it's largely about the expressive potential of that idea. And I think any like strong application has that core. You know, they might have it in there that's like, we want, we expect these five mechanics we're going to implement. We think only maybe three of them are going to work. But as long as the heart of that idea is clear and it's kind of interesting and cool. Mm. Limbo, which I spoke about earlier, right? Like Limbo was pitched purely through that artwork, right? And people looked at that artwork and went, I know what that game is. I don't know what every single moment of that game is, but I know what the feeling and the, the kind of the sense of what that experience is. You know, a project like Warco, right, which, which went through funding, like someone says to you, this is what Warco is, and you go, I know what that game is. I might not know every single moment of execution in it, but I know what it is. Some of the funding applications that I've seen, you go, I don't know what this is. Like, I don't know what your game is, and I don't know why it needs to exist. And I think that that's kind of the, there's a difference, there absolutely is always a difference between what your core idea is and whether that's interesting and clear and compelling. And the execution part is all the stuff you do after you get the money. Hey, we know we were saying we were making this game, but we changed all the mechanics and two of the characters, and now, now someone's wearing a hat, but it's still limbo. You know, like that's the core of it. I think one of the biggest mistakes, and this is probably my biggest top tip, is make sure you write the application for someone reading it for the first time. Don't get obsessed on the micro detail of your game and tell me the names and the outline of the 20 levels in the game before you've even told me that there's multiplayer, which is on page like 50 of your application, right? I don't care what the names of the 20 levels are. Um, I don't care, I'm not judging you on the fine design of the progression of the levels. I'm judging you on the core idea, which you need to communicate the very first, most powerful thing. And then the rough outline of how the game kind of builds that idea. And then if you want to include the list of 20 levels at the back to show them you've thought that through, then that's great. It shows me that you've got a level of micro-understanding, but I'm not judging you on, the, on that detail. And sometimes we've had applications where literally the game design document is one feature at a time, four pages on that feature, down to micro-micro detail. And I can tell you, by the time I get to the end of those first four pages, I'm not really interested in the rest of it anymore because you've turned me off. So I kind of call this, you know, the instructions for a sword is you stamp them with the pointy bit, you know, and that's what you need to do with an application is work out what the pointy bit is and make sure that's what we get. Because if you hit them with the blunt bit, you knock them out, you don't kill them, basically, and we're not interested anymore. So you've yeah. got to, you know, um, and, and I feel like I'm doing a session tomorrow on positioning. And positioning is exactly that. What is the hook is, is basically what all positioning is, and that's probably the single most important thing you can have right in the application because that's what it's going to sell. Just like you say on Limbo, it's like you immediately understand the feeling. It doesn't matter how many levels or what the functionality was, you can understand the, the feeling just simply from that first screenshot or, or that, you know, the one sentence pitch. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. So we might, we might go to the back yeah. end here and then here. Hi. Uh, g'day, I'm a uh, teacher from AIE up in Canberra and um, we're training sort of game students and stuff and we want to perhaps see if, well I want to see if I can push them in the direction of funding a little bit more. Now I've um, gone for some funding and I've got some funding from people like Screen, ACT and stuff. By no means a master at it. So what I suppose I'm asking for is the um, maybe some anecdotes of those instant turnoffs, the, the simple new um, application for dummies sort of thing where it's like, no, nah, you, you lost me. You know, you, you lost me at hello or whatever. I think you've already touched on a few of those. So my, my big one is that I once had an application that was um, 20 pages of backstory before I got to what the game was. And so I, like, I was literally reading it going, I don't know what the game was, I don't know what the game is. And by the time, I just had to read it twice having finished the whole application with what the game was in mind to work it out. So it comes, I mean, it comes down to like, what, what is this thing that you're pitching? Story is, yeah, like don't tell me everything. Like don't tell us everything that's in your head, basically. Like work out what the core of it is. I feel the story like could be swapped. It could be, it could be Vikings or it it's could a, be... It, well, well it, it, didn't, it didn't add to my understanding yeah. of what the player did. Yeah. Honestly, backstory too is... Okay. So, I came from a design background and I'm a bit of a hard ass about this because I think a lot of people want to be designers because they want to come with a whole bunch of bullshit backstory mm. and I don't give two shits. Because backstory is easy, plotting is hard, mm. and interactive narrative that exposes itself to the mechanics of the game is hard. Mm. Tell me how you do that. Mm. I don't care about your world and dragons that came in. Oh, fantasy is the worst. Um, <laughs> you just get pages and pages and pages of this yeah. good stuff. But the quickest summary I can give, and this is what I've always said for design programs, is tell me about the game in the first line, then the first paragraph, then the first page, mm -hmm. and then you've got 19 pages left in the 20 page design document to explain the summary. For anything else you want to do, break out the appendix. So that should touch on every feature in depth, and then when I wanted to, a feature to be implemented, I want it in one page. And that works for games up to budgets of $10 million. Um, because 20 pages is the right amount of time to concisely explain it. If you then need to go through and break out, you've got like 20 levels, you want to talk about the theme for each level. You know, that, that document can go in the appendix, it's just fine. But 20 pages is like one line, one paragraph, one page, 19 pages, one pictures, and uh, get up on the same. I feel like I should, I should add a, a, a do to my, I don't write 20 pages of backstory. Um, like, tell me what the player does. Like, don't tell me what the player is. Like, do not tell me the player is a spaceman unless it's important, right? But tell me what actions the player is able to take. Like, what are the player verbs? What are the concrete things that a player will be doing in my game? And tell me why that is important, right? Like, either through the goal or through the, the emotional experience you want to create. Use um, really concrete descriptions. I feel like, specifically with students, I teach at RMIT, one of the conversations I always have with the students is they say, we want to create an emotional experience. And I go, which particular emotions do you want to use? And they always go, what? <laughs> right? Because they, because they don't know. But they, you know, it's fair if you want to create an emotional experience, but pick one like emotion. You don't want to be sad, do you want to be melancholy, do you want to be misanthropic, do you want to be happy, do you want to be joyful, do you want to be cathartic? You know, pick one and then articulate how you're going to achieve that through what the player does moment to moment. Don't tell me what the player character does moment to moment because they will have backstory and I don't care about backstory mm -hmm. at this stage. I want to know, I want to be able to see in my head what the player is doing on the controller, on the screen, really quickly. And I'm just going to throw something out there too for people who are interested. Go and read a bunch of books on how film does this for two reasons. One, because film has the whole, you know, book to treatment, to script, process, to, to to funding, to on screen, kind of sorted out into a reasonably specific process. Um, and also because they focus on things like, you know, plot and what happens to the characters over, uh, over backstory, which may be important as part of the setup. But also because most of the funding bodies you're dealing with have their uh, historical groundings in film agencies. And it doesn't hurt to be able to talk the language. Mm -hmm. um, helps a lot in that. Mm -hmm.
that's a really big point actually. You do need to take into consideration the level of games and whether we see within the organization as well. Um, we're obviously the three boss club games literate. That's like so like it's it's getting better, but it's certainly not I, I don't think it would be the level you can get a publisher or developer necessarily. So there's a lot of education. Publisher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a lot of education, and even if the person you're dealing with directly who administers the fund has really strong games literacy skills, you know, as you get further and further up the chain, it might get harder and harder to convince them. Um, but I think those elements of pitch are very, yeah. very, no, very, not. very consistent throughout. So, yeah. I mean, well, how do you pitch to a funding body? It's the same as pitch to an investor, essentially. Yeah. But one of the things you've got to do is work out what the body is interested in. So. For example, and I touched on this earlier, the biggest problem with most of the film book applications is they haven't read that it's a loan, it's a business investment, essentially, that they want the money back. Because that money goes into another project, ultimately. The more money that the projects make, the more projects we, you know, they can fund. And they don't deliver a business plan or a marketing plan, or what's there doesn't make any sense. So, you know, you've got to read what the requirements are, what they're looking for. Uh, you know, and Film Vix, for example, it's basically the principle of the, of the system is to make better games coming out of the state. Okay? Screen Australia has talked more about you know, narrative as being an important aspect. So when you go to Screen Australia, make sure you focus on the narrative. When you go to Film Victoria, make sure you focus on the business as much as the design because you're going to be judged on both. Right? Just as if you went to an investor that's putting money and wants money back, you talk about how this is going to be a really successful commercial idea more than you know the intricacies of the game design. But so customize it for your audience, you know, spend time. Don't just take the design document you've been using to make the game and you know write a new first paragraph and chunk it off. You have to make a customized document that, that talks to the audience, you know, that you, you want to go to. And that's that's all about audience to yeah. my mind. We, we have the same thing, you know, design documents inside commercial developers tend to serve two purposes and they're, they're two different audiences. One is for the internal thing that the, the grounding for what they need to build and the other is for the publisher so they know where they're spending the money. And those actually can be quite divergent things and there comes a point where you want to tell the publisher certain things that may not exactly match up with what you're going to do. Um, and that's just the fact of the matter. And so it, it makes sense to understand your audience. And even though there's this thing called a design doc, it's actually, it's always about your audience. It's your audience, the, the internal people who are going to be implement it. And if so, that's probably the inappropriate document to be giving to a, a fund. Um, it's not a bad framework. It's probably got some similarities, but it's also probably not the right thing. Also, feel free to edit. You know, you may have 600 pages of documentation about your project. Delete. Yeah. No, well, don't delete them because they're, they're useful for you and your team and what you're doing, but you don't necessarily need to send every word you've ever written to the, the agency. Yeah, Qu quantity and quality are two very good yeah. things about applications. Remember that they've got to read a lot. I can't stress that enough. It is a very difficult process. Brad's smiling. <laughs> we used to get the folder, literally like two folders, so we got this high of paperwork. Now you just get it digitally and you can read it on the iPad, which is great. But it's you know a lot to read through. You know, my piece of advice as well is find out if you can submit video, which you can do for film with. Find out if you can submit images. Make sure the thing looks nice and it's easy to read on the page. And you know, a two-minute video of you essentially playing the game as live and talking about what the game is is going to do more than your 20-page document because games are a visual medium. If you know if you've got a playable prototype, even better because that is so much more effective than uh, in explaining what your concept is than a bit of document. And also, it immediately says, "Oh, these guys can do this because here is the prototype." So, if you're smart, you want to plan ahead. You know, FilmVit publishes its deadlines well in advance. There's one in April. There's one that's just happened at the end of October. So you know when they are. I um, you know, Screen Australia just said that the next one is now February. You know, find out when the application deadlines are. And make sure your game's at the right point to submit. Don't just go, oh my god, the deadline's in two weeks, I've got to rustle something up together. If you, if you plan smart, you can get your application to the right point where it's, it's not so far down into development that you know you can't change things, um, but it's enough there that you can show a little prototype and a little video and you've got images, you can kind of show that it, it's working. Um, you know, and if you're really smart, you have two projects on the go and you will time your projects around these funding grants so that you can be finishing up a project at the point where you're submitting one and then you can hold off on 
working on that new project that you submitted until you hear back about the grants. Meanwhile, you're finishing and you're releasing you know, the game that you're coming to an end of. What you want to be careful of is if you don't you know, go into this project that you really need 20 or 30 grand from the funding body to finish, and then you spend the 10 weeks that it takes for these applications to turn around, like throwing way loads of your own time and money in, only to be rejected, and then you're left with this 30 grand hole in your budget and nowhere to go. You know, so if, if you're thinking about this as a, as a business, you want to be looking at these grants and, and how they fit into your timelines, um, and essentially not shooting yourself in the foot, I guess, by not planning that makes sense. I think we have a question here, and then one on the other side. Uh, uh, yeah, it's not actually the amount of money, I guess, to ask for different energies. Um, we have some business mentors that are helping us out in more traditional business practices, and they've been telling us to like, bump up the amount we're asking for, because I guess everyone starts small, and then they immediately say yes, and then they ask for more money. Um, so we've been like padding our budgets and that kind of thing to, to get to it. But then you guys are saying you don't want to ask. I mean, you know how much games should be, like how much text to make them. So we're kind of curious. Is it, should we tailor that towards different people that we're, that we're asking for money? So if it's, I don't know, some of the things mm. should be asked for a different amount. Of it. If people talk, um, <laughs> pretty much pretty much everybody across the funding agencies is interconnected and talks. And I know that you're obviously talking about a theoretical added budget of another project as opposed to anything you're actually doing <laughs> that may go into a funding application. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but I think it all, it all depends on how padded it is and what it means. Like if you're living in credible shit and you know, it, so if you're talking about a, a project made by students who have almost no living expenses, are used to eating noodles, and they to do that for another six months, that, that's a group of people who can make 40k a lot of one way. If you're talking about, you know, 10 people um, who are professionals in a studio, they, they can eat, you know, well, at uh, AAA studio rates, they eat somewhere like 200 grand a month. Um, it adds up really quickly. And uh, depends on the EA's metrics, it's about that. Um, so there's, there is a lot of range, but it's certainly something that's harder to get. It's harder to get an amount of money when you say we're going to pay five people five, five salaries for the next six months than if, when you look at the application for the this is going to spend everything um, to make it happen. You know, they're going to. They're going to plow every cent of this back into making this game as, as good as possible. So you, you can certainly tell. And if it's good bang for buck, then that's a better application. I think two things. I think you need to consider what the risk is of you padding that budget. You know, like if you go in too high, will that will you get knocked back basically because people like us will be sitting there going, there's no way mm. like this costs this much. The other thing is that um, budgets change naturally. You know, I've done, you know, I've got government funding for free play and I've had to submit a quarter report. So you look at your original budget and you look at your final budget and you go, there is no actual correlation <laughs> between what I said nine months ago and what actually happened. So, you know, and things went up and things went down and things went around and stuff. So, like, even when you pitch for a specific thing, you say, I want money to do this. Like, a little bit comes off, a little bit goes into this, but a little bit goes here. Um, but I. Yeah, I, th I think when you're applying for government funding, you sort of need to go, like, I can just ask for all of this, and the risk is that, the, the worst risk is that they will give me nothing. They might give me less than I ask for, which might make be what I want, or they'll give me all of it, right? But the more I ask for, it increases the risk of them rejecting it completely. And I think it comes back to that appropriateness, you know, work out how much fat you have and how much fat you feel you can trim off in order that it still feels realistic. I think that, you know, don't, don't add like 20% per staff member and don't add, we need to buy 100 copies of, of Mia and five computers, you know, like don't go crazy. Like every budget has a little bit of fat in it, right? Well, he says it's a guy who's currently applied for government funding. Yeah, hoping to go on. <laughs> that's, that's called contingency. Yeah. Like it's a reasonable thing to put in the bottom budget. Um, and that's, that's the other thing, there's some, there's some really good rules of thumb to, to banging out a game development budget. Because game development budgets aren't harder. In, in the end, um, the rule of thumb used in the industry is that it's 10K per man month, and that covers everything. So that's, that's for a commercial studio. That gets up to about 12.5 now is the average. 
it's about 18 to 19 printing A or similar, and it's about 6 printing. So, but you can take that map and you can work out that that should pretty much pay for everything. And this is the number of months and this is the number of people, and that's the ballpark. And then you work in some tech and some marketing and, uh, and a bit of contingency and round that into something. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking for is this in the sensible range or is this on the crazy book? And it's three people working for three months and I want three hundred thousand dollars. Specifically with Victoria again, they want the money back. Which yeah. means you need to think about how many units do you have to sell? I can tell you that maybe one in twenty applications would actually include, okay, our budget is hundred thousand dollars, we're gonna sell this for a dollar, that will take thirty percent, therefore you know we need to sell hundred and forty thousand copies of this. And does that make sense, right? So immediately you say, well, if they can't even do that, do they really have a handle on what's required to make this game? But you know, you, you need to do that because you may get to that point and go, actually, 140,000 copies is a hell of a lot, and this game probably is going to do it. In which case, you need to change your budget, or you need to think about your business model and can you charge more in a different way or, or whatever, right? Um, so make sure your budget is commercial if your audience is a commercial model. Okay, it may be slightly different, I guess, New South Wales and Sweden, Australia, I don't know what their specific criteria are. Um, they may be happier about funding something that's going to achieve something that's not commercial. But, you know, it's very specific to which whether they expect a return, you know, for the money to come back. So you do need to make sure you bear, bear that in mind. So we only have like five minutes left, but I think we've got a question on the point of five. And that would be close. In kind or as a as, as a, a fee, as an actual physical dollar amount. I we only is that seen as inappropriate. I've done some kind of um I've done commercial over plus and those kind of things with technology. So if it's been very specific technology development, I have always put in that particular person's time if they've been the predominant business owner or something like that. But with the speaking of with the kind of innovation one being more ideas and concept based. Is it yeah, someone still has to make it. Yeah, like, like I totally, I think the wage in there. Um, so it can be a physical dollar amount rather than an in-kind or investment at the back end. Or yeah, something. yeah, you're not talking about the time that leads into producing the documentation. You're talking about the time that makes the product from the moment you receive the funding. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a that's a staff member. Yeah, sure. And what about for the one um, that was called just having new title? The only new one, screen server? Yeah, but the, the up to 50,000 one, is it okay to put those fees on the consultancy fees? Yeah, I just think that, the, again, it comes to the appropriate and starts to fall the same way. Yeah, you know, it's these, a reasonable these, fee. Exactly. Okay. These are people who are going to help make it happen, yeah. and, and it's a reasonable fee, that's fine. Um, I'm never a fan of watching large amounts of cash disappear, disappear into producers. Mm -hmm. um, who are intermediaries to the development mm -hmm. as opposed to directly involved. Oh, yes. But provided it's a, it's so a direct involvement. So if it was a producer or something like myself, it would be less inappropriate than if it was, for example, a designer or a programmer who was developing it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
and I guess I think you sort of answered it. Like, is there any is there any preferences about spreading money around to a number, of, you know, giving a, a, a larger number of teams a small amount of money, or uh, do you guys favour larger, more ambitious projects that will make a bigger splash? And um, you, you know, is there any preferences, or do you take each game on their own merits, or what do you like to do with your money? Well, <laughs> it's probably very different from from Chris and my capacity because we only get if FilmVet gets like forty applications, right. we we see three the reassets um, and I'd say like I've done the numbers and like Film Victoria has funded a big spread of big projects to very small things. Um, Screen Australia I, I need to look at and I'm not sure in this has new set rules. But that's actually a, like a policy thing, like what does the funding agency want to do? Um, for us as assessors we see single projects, that's all we care about and we write a report based on that. And it comes back to all of that stuff about is this achievable. At the end of the day all we all we say is yes, we believe that this should get the money, or no, we don't believe this should get the money, and then we write a bunch of reasons about why that should happen. I mean, give you an insight into what happens if you want to crack and shake it out. But basically, we rate every application. I think this is, this is listed in the guidelines. You know, is it um, uh, originality, you know, quality, and commercial? Yes. And we rate them out of 10, and we get a score at the end of that from you know, about, about seven or eight people that actually end up giving a, a score. And we use that to very quickly rank all the applications that we've seen. And obviously the ones right at the top, it's pretty unanimous that we all think that they should be getting money. But we go through it. Sometimes something will score higher and we still feel that actually it's not really a good project because of the amount of money they're, they're looking for or whatever. But by and large, that's the way we do it. And there's a set amount of money that is available in all these funds, you know. And if you haven't allocated all the money, that's great. No hard decisions. If you got too many projects you want to fund and not enough money, then it comes down to which ones do we feel are better. You know, there's no real priority given to, okay, the more quantity of applications is going to be better. Um, it really comes down to then like just weighing up the, the feeling of the individual applications and which ones we really feel are the strongest. Um, you know, it's, it's been, so, so it's a pretty straightforward process. And, and, I can't think of any time in Dream Victoria where we really had, had to have the discussion of around, okay, we just fund these four projects or this one, which, which is the better fit to them. Cool. Um, we may have to call that uh, a day. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, yes. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>